So good morning. What a great way to start the weekend. My name is Dale Gotro. I'm the director of the Institute for Leadership Advancement. On behalf of our Dean Robert Summercrest and the Terry College of Business, let me welcome you to the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. Now I have three responsibilities. My first one is to ask you if you have already, just take a moment and please silence your phone. My second one is to uh, point out that you will uh, if you'll kindly uh, fill out the response card that you found in your seat and drop it off in the basket on the way out. There are opportunities to win gift packages as a result of that. And then my third responsibility is to introduce you to our to your student host. Nate Tippy is going to come and introduce our speaker. Nate is a uh, 2012 Leonard Scholar, Finance and Mass Media <coughs> Arts major. So he spends time both in the Terry College of Business as well as the Grady School. And uh, Nate's going to come and welcome you and introduce our speaker for this morning. Thank you for being here. So, Nate? Today I have the privilege of introducing to you my family friend and now employer, Tim Chapman. Chapman studied economics here at the University of Georgia. He began his career in investments in 1981 after earning his Series 7 certification while in school. In 1991, he teamed up with Don Beasley to start Personal Mutual Fund Management, also known as PMFM. At that time, Chapman and Beasley created the actively managed investment model that is still in use at Stadium to win by not losing. In 2001, Stadium created 401k toolbox to offer retirement account management. And five years later, Stadium launched two <coughs> mutual funds, Stadium Managed Portfolio and Stadium, Stadium Core Advantage Portfolio. Soon after, PMFM crossed $1 billion in total assets under management and was featured on the cover of Investment Advisor magazine. In 2009, PMFM was rebranded as Stadium Money Management and built a national wholesale team. Today, Stadium, based in Watkinsville, manages over $6 billion in assets and is the title sponsor of the Stadium Classic, a, a nationwide tour golf tournament held annually at the UGA Golf Course. Tim and his wife, Leah, reside in Greensboro, Georgia, and have a son and three daughters. In his time at UGA, he worked as a manager for the football team and is now a member of the Letterman's Club. He was part of the 1980 national championship team. Tim has always encouraged me in my ambitions, and as you will see, he has a great sense of humor. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Tim Chapman. That out of the way. It's uh, what an honor to be here, back on campus, and uh, Dr. Gothrow was saying this is a great way to start the weekend. The great way to start the week is by beating the Florida Gators last night. Uh, in fact, I was thinking this morning, 30 years ago, was we were in my senior, my senior season was the 1981 football season. By the way, and people ask me sometimes, what did the manager do? Well, back then, 1980, my job was to stand on the sidelines and say, Joe Herschel. And I just, <laughs> a very good job of that, but um, I was looking back at the schedule 30 years ago when I was in my fourth year here in Georgia, uh, we were getting ready to play Florida, our ninth game of the season, and I saw this morning in the red and black, they're having a special promotion tomorrow for homecoming, uh, it's helmet day, if you bring a helmet you can play, <laughs> particularly as a running back. They, they should have known something was up when the guy dressing for Doritos with the power rate. I knew that was <laughs> But listen, it is fun to be here. And I want to share with you, before I get into to the talk, I've got a lot of special people here with me today. A lot of our team members from Stadium. I go all over the country speaking to a bunch of strangers, strangers, and we have people in our home office who've never heard me speak. And so today we have a lot of our team members here. I also have my mom. Uh, Marm Chapman, who's here, my wife Leah, and our daughter Hannah, who's in her second year, and my niece Anna, 
And uh, I thought I was going to have my mother-in-law too. So I'm thinking this morning, I'm going to have my wife, my mother, and my mother-in-law. I've never been so nervous in all my life <laughs> as to give this talk. But it is special. And I can tell you this, the older you get, the more you'll realize their relationships in your life are very important. They mean a lot to you. Um, there's an old country saying that if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. Well, I'm the proverbial turtle on the fence post. Uh, I get a lot of attention. I get a lot of focus on me because I'm the CEO of Stadium and we've done some pretty good things. But really, it's everybody else that's responsible for, for having that turtle on the fence post. And so I owe it all to them and, and I appreciate everything they do. So let me tell you a little bit about my background and then try to leave you with a couple of points that hopefully will help you. Um, I was here in Georgia, had a great time. Uh, Leah and I fell in love. By the way, Leah's a Terry College graduate, finance degree. Amy, our oldest daughter, is a, a, a graduated with honors. I don't know what those, if magna cum laude or summa or something. I mean, it was way up there. Uh, she's working for Google out in Northern California now. Our daughter, Lori Ann, is 22. Uh, she's here at Georgia. She's not here today. I'm sure she's in the library right now. <laughs> and, uh, and then Hannah's in her second year. Uh, but our time, and our son, our oldest child is a boy, Josh. He went to Georgia College and State University, and yet no one believes red and black more than he does. So Georgia is an incredible part of our lives, and it's an honor for me to be here. But it all started, we were here, my, first introduction to the University of Georgia was 1976 when Georgia played Alabama. And it was not quite the game of the century like Alabama LSU is supposed to be tomorrow night, but it was a pretty big game now. Alabama coming to Athens, uh, Bear Bryant coaching, and my best friend and I, his brother was in the Red Coat Marching Band. We actually snuck in with the band. We sort of wiggled our way in and they came marching in we came in the game. Georgia beat Alabama 21 to nothing. It was one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in my life. No one in my family had really been to college. We had no college affiliation or connection. And I went home and said, look, I'm going to the University of Georgia. So that's how it all got started. And I had a great time here, met Leah, we fell in love, and we actually got married the summer before my senior year. And uh, I was in, I was gonna be in journalism school. I was gonna be the next Keith Jackson. How many of you are old enough to remember Keith Jackson? One of the greatest football play-by-play -play guys ever. Um, so I go tell Leah's dad, we want to get married. And he said, well, how are you going to support my daughter? And I said, I'm going to be the next Keith Jackson. And he said, whoa, Nelly. <laughs> you need a business degree. And so uh, at that time, we were on the quarter system, not the semester system. But at that time, maybe it's still like this. You could get an economics degree through the College of Arts and Sciences. So you didn't actually have to be in the Terry College. And um, so I could save more of my credits by going that route. The problem is you had to have foreign languages. You had to have four quarters of Spanish. And I took the first quarter of Spanish and hated it. So I kept putting off Spanish and putting off Spanish and putting off Spanish. I get all the way through every course I have to have, except I'm still three quarters of Spanish short. As Nate told you, I already have my Series 7, which is sort of like your stockbroker's license. I was already working, chomping at the bit to get going. It's 1982, the spring of 82, and I'm thinking, why in the world will I ever need to know how to speak Spanish? Right. And so, uh, so I, I left. So out of all those Georgia degrees, the ones I've paid for, the ones I'm paying for, Leah being a Georgia graduate, I never graduated. So I you know, carefully worded in that little introduction, he attended the University of Georgia. Right? But I had a great time being here. And it laid the groundwork of the foundation for the work that was to come because it was a football coach who quit coaching that got me in the investment business to begin with. Sam Mitchell, he's still here, still in practice over on Millage Avenue, and a wonderful man. And he's the one who not only told me I should do it, but encouraged me in those early days when I really didn't know what I was doing. And he sort of bolstered my confidence and, and, and helped me learn and put me in touch with people who could help me learn. And so I owe a lot to the people, even then, the relationships you have, that they pour themselves into your life and make a real difference. We left Georgia in the spring of 82, 
And I went back to my hometown, Jonesboro, Georgia, just south of Atlanta, south of the airport, and set up my company at that time. 21 years old, I, went, I was in a one-room office, 12 by 12, one-room office. I rented from an attorney friend of mine. It was $125 a month. And I'm thinking, how can I ever afford $125 a month? It seemed like all the money in the world. Found some used furniture, uh, and I'll never forget the first week, the furniture had just been delivered. I had a, a phone, it was a desk, a chair, two chairs on the other side. The phone, a princess trim line, like you had in your house back then. You know, I hadn't, even, I hadn't even taken it out of the box yet. And I hear somebody coming down the hall. And you have to understand, at that age, I was all about form, I was all about substance over form. Excuse me, the other way around. Form over substance. I cared about how things looked. I cared about the impression I was, I was making. I hear somebody coming down the hallway, so I grab this phone and start having a pretend conversation. I'm trying to I said, yes, sir, I'll be happy to talk with you next week. Well, um, my calendar's full. How about the following week? Uh, and you know what our minimums are. I think I can help you. Uh, that'll be fine. And so by this time, the guy's at the door, I hang up and I say, sir, may I help you? And he said, yeah, I'm here to install that phone. <laughs> when you put too much emphasis on the form over substance, you're going to be revealed. Right? It doesn't, you, you, you've got to have substance to what you're doing. I didn't realize that so much then. I also didn't know uh, what I didn't know. Uh, you, you've probably heard before, you have your known unknowns in business. That's things you don't know, but at least you know you don't know. The things that are most dangerous, because you can find the answers to those other things, the thing that's most dangerous to your success in business are the unknown unknowns. You don't know it, and you don't even know that you don't know it. And that is typically revealed to you through experience. Again, you may have heard this said before that uh, good decisions come from experience. But oftentimes experience comes from bad decisions. So you learn by actually doing, by actually being on the battlefield, by being there every day. Uh, the, the education that, that begins after class, after you leave the classroom, and you gain that experience. And there's no shortcut for that. I wish there were. How many of you have ever read the book, uh, Talent is Overrated? Have you seen that? I, I would highly recommend you read it. Um, the author's name is Jeff Colvin. And in that book, he talks about uh, just how difficult it is to, to gain the experience and the experience you really need to be successful. And he destroys the myth that people are successful because they're bright, that people are successful because they're naturally talented. And he explains pretty empirically that success most often is directly attributed to the amount of work you put in, how hard you work, your deliberate practice, not just practice, but deliberate practice, practice that actually makes you better at the task you're trying to accomplish. And it takes a very long time to gain that experience. And I was 21 years old chomping at the bits. I didn't have a lot of patience. I'm sure many of you feel that way right now. You're anxious about what might happen in the job market when you leave next year or the year after. And you're, you want to get things going and you have great plans and you're ambitious and all that stuff is wonderful. At the same time, you've got to have a measure of patience. You, you don't fall into some of the, the traps I did. Don't put form over substance. Realize what's important. Have the patience to gain that experience because it's so important. And he uses a good example. Maybe this will help you understand why there's no substitute for uh, immersing yourself into a subject and learning everything there is about it. They were showing, uh, studying people's memory. You know, and, and one of the tests they had, they took a, a chessboard and pieces were arrayed just in different places on the board. And it was a game, like a, a, a game that was in progress, middle of the game, just stop, walk away, or wherever the pieces are, they let people look at it. You and I, unless you're a chess master, and you may be, but I'm not, if I looked at that board, it was very difficult to remember more than about 10 or 11 pieces. You get 30 seconds trying to stare at it, remember where everything is, and it, 
for most people, it was like seven to 12 would be about the right number you can remember. But for chess masters, they remembered every piece. This is what's interesting though. If the pieces were not just, if a game was not stopped in progress, and the pieces were just put on the board in some totally random fashion, the chess masters couldn't remember any more than you or I could. See, when they looked at the game in progress, they didn't see pieces on the board. They understood what was going on. They saw a game in progress. They, they knew the moves that got the pieces to where they were and what moves were probably going to happen subsequent to that. Let me give you the analogy he uses to help you understand it. If you saw random letters just displayed on the board, it'd be very difficult for you to remember their order, the sequence of those letters. Most people, again, can remember 7 to 12. But if those letters were arranged in a sequence that spelled a word, you wouldn't have any problem remembering it all because it means something to you. Well, you can't gain uh, the understanding to have certain things mean something to you until you've had that experience. So I'm encouraging you to be patient as you go out there chomping at the bit. I know how you feel, but you be as, as bright as you can, as learned as you can be, but also realize you're going to have to have some experience. And so as you go about getting that experience, I want you to uh, also think that this is a long journey. Now, let me go back to our business for a second. 1982, <coughs> opened up that office I was telling you about. In 1991, by the way, I will tell you, for those of you who are interested in being in the investment business, I wouldn't recommend doing it the way I did it, okay? No one is lined up around the block for a 21-year-old to tell them how to invest in money. You don't, you don't go back to your hometown when people's most recent memories are of you rolling their front yard and have them trust you with their investment portfolio. Um, but, so we, we go through that decade of the 80s, which was really a very, very good time in the market. In fact, um, again, for those of you who are really into finance, the market tends to move in long secular markets. Secular just being long-term, cyclical is more short-term. We had a secular bull market that started in August of 1982 and went all the way to March of 2000. 18 years, it was the greatest bull market in the history of our country. Um, I'm not taking credit for it just because I got into business right at that uh, point in time. But it was a wonderful time to be in the business. But I was young, not very successful. I really had no business to speak of. In 1991, Don Beasley and I formed what at that time was called Personal Mutual Fund Management. And we were going to manage money, as Nate said, in a winning by not losing kind of way. We were using technical market analysis. Now, you have to realize we've been nine years at that point into a wonderful bull market, a couple of cyclical bear markets, 87 and 90. But it's been a great time to invest. And then the 90s continue to be really a great decade. And here we are managing money using technical analysis with a winning by not losing approach, and it, it doesn't make sense to people. It, people would almost laugh at us. You could throw a, a dart at the Wall Street Journal and pick stocks that were going up. Why have any kind of, why ever be out of the market? Why, why have any defensive measures in your, in your model because the market was just going up? You never had to worry about it. In five years' time, we were $25 million under management. We were definitely a fish swimming against the stream. If you see any of our collateral material now, that's what you'll see on the front. It's a fish swimming against the stream because that's what we were doing. We finally, around 2002, you know, there was a bad market, obviously, 2001 and 2002. The tech bubble burst. Um, and so, People realize what we've been saying all these years might make sense, that it mattered that you didn't lose money. You had to protect against big losses. So by 2002, 2003, we finally hit $100 million of assets under management. Now that was a big milestone for us. It had taken us from 91 to about 2002, so 11 years to hit $100 million in assets under management. 
in 19, uh, in, excuse me, in 2007, we hit a billion. So from 02 to 07, we went from 100 to a billion. I spoke to the Terry uh, Third Thursday group in October, this time of the year, Mark, I think two years ago, 2009. We were 2.6 billion. So from 07 to 09, we've gone from a billion to 2.6. Today, we're over 6 billion, two years later. Now, all along the way, people were telling me we couldn't do what we were trying to do. Very smart people. In the 401k business, where we were the first company in the country to offer managed accounts for 401k participants, people who said, I don't want to have to manage my 401k money myself. We offered managed accounts. The smartest people in this industry told me, you can't do that. <coughs> no one will pay for that. One of our big competitors who was saying that was Bill Sharp, the Stanford economics professor, who won the Nobel Prize. He's saying, you can't do that. And here I am, didn't even get my degree in economics. And I didn't believe it. I thought we could do it. Not only did I think we could do it, we did. Now they do it. How about that? So all along, we're swimming against the stream and people are saying, you really can't do what you're doing. So here's what I want to leave, leave you with, and then I'll, I'll Take your questions. Um, a couple of things are really important. First of all, you have to believe in what you're doing. You really have to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe in yourself most. I love the story of Roger Bannister. You, I know a lot of you probably heard the story, but it was believed that impossible to run a four-minute mile, a sub-four-minute mile. For centuries, it was believed to be impossible. Our lung capacity wasn't great enough, our bone structure wouldn't allow it, whatever. You could not run a mile in less than four minutes. No one had ever done it. Until a cold, rainy day in Oxford, England in 1954, and a young medical student named Roger Bannister ran a mile in less than four minutes. It was an incredible accomplishment. All around the world, maybe news all around the world. Uh, Sports Illustrated picked his athlete of the year. It was a big deal. But let me tell you what's most relevant to me and you in that story. The next year, 17 more runners ran a sub four minute mile. Two years afterwards, 300 runners ran a mile in less than four minutes. This year at the NCAA track meet, the person who finishes dead last in the 1600 meters will run a sub four minute mile. Now, nothing has changed. Our lung capacity didn't change. Our, our skeletal structure didn't change. The only thing that changed is those people trained to run believing it could be done. You gotta believe in what you're doing, believe in yourself. You have to have a vision, the second thing. You, you really have to have a big picture vision. I talked to you about the need for experience and how you can't, you can't take shortcuts when it comes to that. I, would, I wish I could tell you you could, but you can't. But you also have to have a bigger vision of what you're trying to accomplish over time. Three guys working on the street. The fellow asked ask each of them what they're doing. The first guy says, I'm laying cement blocks. The next guy says, I'm building a wall. The third guy says, I'm helping to construct the most beautiful cathedral the world will ever see. Now, all of them are right. All those answers are accurate. But you see how one of them had a real vision for what was happening and what would happen over time. When you do things, particularly if you set up your own business, it's tough. But you don't have to be in your own business for things to be tough. You can be in the business of education. If, if, if the faculty here, if Dean Sumacrest and, and Dale Gotro and everyone who's working with you here, they have a passion for your education. And that's why they do what they do, even when it's tough. In business, if you don't have a passion for what you're trying to accomplish, it is too tough sometimes to make the problem. 
if you don't really believe in what you're doing. I tell our people all the time, they can attest. We're having an impact on people's lives. We're not just managing money. In the 401k business, for example, we have over 120,000 individual 401k accounts we manage. But those aren't account numbers, those are real people. There's a story behind every one of those account numbers. There's a single mom trying to raise a couple of kids and put back a little bit of money so one day she might be able to retire. You know, there's a couple, two income couples struggling to make it, hoping that they can, you know, get a long weekend down at Panama City and they're trying to save a little bit. There's stories, there are people behind every one of those account numbers. We're changing their lives. We're having an impact. If I can keep them from losing a lot of money in bear markets so that they can retire one day, we've made an impact. That's our vision. We believe passionately in what we're doing. And you have to believe in what you're doing if you're going to have the, the determination and the persistence and the drive to get through those tough times because I promise you there will be tough times. You know, I can tell you story after story after story of things that happened in the past 30 years on this journey that Leah and I have been on that were not easy. You've got to believe in yourself and believe in what you do. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, you've all heard the story of the bumblebee. It was in the 1930s. There was a Swiss, really smart Swiss math guy. That's hard to say, Swiss math guy that proved mathematically that bumblebees couldn't fly. Their wings were too small to support the, the weight of their body. He proved it. Well, the problem with that is you walk outside and you see bumblebees fly around. Fortunately, 40 years, about 40 years later, they finally were able to measure uh, the lift that's created with two sets of wings, not just one wing on each side, two sets of wings going back and forth together rapidly. They were, they were able to measure how much lift that created and explain how the bumblebee could in fact fly. Now you don't think for 40 years bumblebees walked around on the ground everywhere they went because some smart guy said they couldn't fly. And yet that's what happens to us sometimes. Some really smart person tells you you can't do something or it can't be done that way. And so oftentimes people never pursue their dreams. They never even try because someone has stolen that from them by, and that person doesn't know. That person, person doesn't know. So what I'm going to leave you with here today is don't listen to what they say. If you have a good idea, if you believe in yourself, if you have a vision for what you can accomplish, you just fly. You fly. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and share this morning with you. It's such an honor. Thanks for having me. She was asking, through, through the growth we've had, uh, how do we keep the organizational values? Um, and it's a challenge. I think that's a challenge for any organization. But we try very hard. We, we make a, a, a determined, dedicated effort to do that. And part of it is in the type of people you recruit. We look for people who fit. You know, uh, if any of you, if you've read uh, Good to Great, again, a, a book that you really need to read if you haven't read it already, Jim Collins, he talks about the importance of getting the right people on the bus, but more importantly, getting them in the right seat on the bus. And we work really hard at getting the right people on the bus to begin with. We do things, I, I believe you have to take care of your clients, but I believe you also have to take care of your employees. And we try to do that. We, we try to make sure people are well paid, that they're rewarded financially, but also we let them know we value them. There's an old saying in the financial services business when you're talking about clients, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. 
And I think that's true with your employees also. That they need to know that you care. We do little things. We buy lunch for our employees every day. We have, um, you know, we have it brought in. We have a little lunch room. It's a sort of a social time. Sometimes it's a work time. People are working on things. They continue to work right through lunch. But we try to do things to let people know uh, that they matter to us. From a company integrity standpoint and ethics, the, the investment business is a heavily regulated business. We have a lot of things. We have to have policies and procedures and all that. And, and so we do that. But ultimately, again, as I tell our people, we're, we're going to do what's right, not because that's what the policy says, but because that's who we are as people. And, and we try to have that kind of attitude throughout everything we do. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. What sort of risk modeling does Stadium use to determine the volatility of its assets and its portfolios? Her question is, what, what kind of risk modeling do we use? That is an entire topic unto itself sometimes <laughs> that 98% of the people probably don't want to hear, but I'll <laughs> tell you, um, it's, it's, there's two levels of what we're doing. First, at a macro level, we're looking at a lot of market data, a lot of internal data. Things like uh, advances, declines, new highs, new lows, volumes. Uh, and, and what they do is they don't really help you predict the market. No one can predict the market. But what they tell you is the internal health of the market. A good analogy would be um, if the weatherman tells you it's, there's a 40% chance of rain today. You don't know for sure it's going to rain. They're just saying the atmospheric conditions are right that rain is a possibility. But if there's a 40% chance of rain, you take your umbrella with you, right? And you don't know for sure it's gonna rain, but if it does start to rain, you react. That's sort of the way we manage money. We're measuring risk levels. We can't tell if the market's headed for a bad time, but we can tell when dark clouds are overhead. And so we need to have our umbrella handy. And then the second level, we only buy and sell exchange-traded funds, ETFs. They're like, index funds that trade like a stock. And so the second step of our process is when we are invested, making sure we're in the best sectors of the market possible. Yes, Um, the, the question was, having gone through rough times, you made some decisions that didn't work out so well, how do you keep your confidence that the next decision you make will be okay? Is that, yeah. um, well, like what I usually do is blame somebody. <laughs> so it's never my fault. It never shakes my fault. There are times when... Um, it, it goes back for me, okay? This is just my perspective. Let, let, me, let me share a little bit about perspective real quickly. Perspective is an interesting thing. You can have two people look at the same situation and come to a completely different conclusion, okay? The other day, I came out of a convenience store with, store with a Snickers bar. I love Snickers bar. And Leah's always asked me to eat healthy, lose weight, you know? She sees me with a Snickers bar and she said, you have no discipline. And I said, that's not true. You don't know how many I wanted. <laughs> but from, from my perspective, uh, I believed so strongly in what we were doing. And I was willing to accept imperfection because the investment business is a business about imperfection. There is nobody who's perfect in the investment business. Never has been, never will be. So I was willing to accept the imperfections, and then it was just a matter of being, I don't know if it's tenacious or stubborn or stupid, but during the periods when the way we manage money is out of favor, this year's been a tough year for us for example. Just sticking to it. It's what we do, and we're going to stick to it. So that's a lot of the tough times. I mean, early on, it's just building business. It's paying the bills, finding enough money to pay the light bill, and, you know, I can still remember it was the mid-90s. Think about that now. I've been in business for, I started in, in 82, so you know it had been 10 or 12 years, and we finally got to the point in business where I could draw a $1,000 a week salary, 52000 bucks a year. And Leah can tell you, we were ecstatic. 
The next year, business had grown so much, I was able to lease through the business, actually lease a Ford Taurus. I had it going on. Right? <laughs> the challenge, there are a lot of challenges to growing businesses, and it was, you know, I guess I can question myself at times back then about whether or not this was ever going to be successful because it was such a struggle. But I, again, I just really believed in what we were doing. I will say this also, let me add one more point. You have to forgive yourself if you make a bad decision. Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric, uh, he once had a division president who made a bad decision and cost the company like six or seven hundred million dollars. They asked him if he was going to fire him. And he said, well, why should I fire him? I just invested six hundred million dollars in his education. <laughs> so maybe be a little more forgiving of yourself if, if there is a bad decision and say, okay, that was the cost of Part of my education, right? Other, other questions? Yes? Hi, my name is James Rewood, and my question is, uh, being an entrepreneur, how do you balance optimism and confidence that you spoke of with humility? Well, I've never been humble, so I'm not sure. <laughs> um, no, his question is, how do you balance confidence and optimism with humility? Um, you, you have to realize, and th th again, this is, my personal belief system. The credit doesn't go to me, the glory doesn't go to me. Okay? My favorite verse is in Proverbs. It says, uh, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And that's certainly true in my life. Uh, and it's been true in our business. And so, you, but you look around, you surround yourself with great people. And that's what we have at Stadium. Um, I, I, I'm hardly ever at the office. I'm out traveling, speaking, doing what I do. But we have wonderful people who do a great job of what they're doing. And so they really do deserve the credit in that situation. And so I'm confident about our future because I'm confident in them. And um, I, I hope as a company we never exhibit a pridefulness that, it, that puts people off. But yet I want people to know we are confident about what we're doing. Any other questions? Um, how did you, I guess, being you know, being an asset management company from Georgia how, and, and starting out from the bottom, how did you compete against uh, well-known um, firms and you know, firms that have been forever known on Wall Street and around the country? How did you kind of... Uh, his question is, how do you compete as a small firm? How do you get big household name type firms? And, you know, we still have that even today. Um, in the early days, we were much more of a retail-oriented firm. By that, I mean we were calling directly on clients. So we would call individuals and try to convince them that we should be managing their money. Today, everything we do is through the financial advisor community. So we're calling on the financial advisors and showing them why they should have a portion of their client's portfolio in the stadium. And so we are still competing. You know, why should they use us and not Fidelity or Vanguard or Putnam or T. Rowe Price or, or whomever? Um, and so, in this business though, if you have a good idea and you can at least get an audience for someone to listen to it, they don't necessarily want to have to go to the big brand name. I mean, we're still a drop in the bucket. We're at six billion, a little more than six billion dollars, which I think officially makes us the largest uh, investment management firm in Watkinsville. <laughs> but otherwise, you know, it just doesn't compare with, with the big names. So, so we're still just a blip on the radar. We still have that same challenge, and you do it just by trying to get in front of the people, tell them your story, and hope that story resonates, and, and you develop a product. So. Other questions? I think we have time for one more. One more. Sure. Early on, you mentioned relationships and the importance of relationships. Are there any that you can point to that are maybe UGA related or from your experience here that helped you other than marrying your wife? Yeah, well, and. <laughs> There are so many, I, I probably couldn't go into all of them, but you know, Leah, the one thing I have to say uh, for her, we, we got married young, had no money, spent a lot of the years of our life with no money, and yet she never lost confidence. You're talking about how do you maintain that confidence through the tough times, and so, you know, that, that is obviously critical. And, and uh, But, you know, there's so many people. I, I um, There were some professors here that meant a lot to me. Coach Dooley, my freshman year, uh, one of my jobs was driving Coach Dooley to all the speaking engagements. So I was in the car with Coach Dooley for hours at a time. 
And if we had won the previous weekend, that was fun. If we had lost, it was not fun. But I learned a lot just from being around them. Uh, there were some people early on in, in business that were important. I think J.B. Fuqua once said that we're all a product of everybody we've ever come in contact with. And that's so true. So it would really be difficult to, to go down that list. Listen, again, thanks for having me here. What an honor. I appreciate you spending your time here this morning. Thank you. On behalf of Terry College and the Institute for Leadership Advancement, I'd like to thank you by presenting you with this photo. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. On your way out, please be sure to grab a little token of appreciation for being here and a reminder that we'll be back in February with the Terry Leadership Speaker Series. Our guest that day will be Tim Adams, who is uh, president for Macy's Private Grand Division. So have a great weekend.